Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the big news today, all over the CNNs and the MSNBCs and all over the place, the Fox News is even. Uh, Rudy Giuliani had his apartment and his office raided by the FBI looking for uh, electronic devices. Uh, understand, you know, he's, Rudy's done some shady stuff. And people are looking into it and get used to it. We're going to see a lot more because even, you know, even if you go beyond his work with the Ukraine, uh, as my friend Bob Nay loves to remind me, uh, Rudy Giuliani and his firm did work for the MEK, uh, the Mujahideen Kalk, while they were on the terror list. Uh, but hey, it's Rudy, America's mayor. So maybe, maybe there's some who will give him a pass. Uh, someone who I know who will not give him a pass, our good friend Jared Yates Sexton. He is uh, the the, pod, the host of the fabulous podcast, uh, Muck Rake. Also has written a terrific book, American Rule, How the a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. We'll get links on how you can check that out. Jared, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks. I, I, I'm feeling a little like I might not be able to make it through this segment. I'm so disappointed that Rudy Giuliani, America's mayor, who has always been such on the up and up, Rick. Like, it, it's incredible that this guy might have gotten entangled in something. I don't know if maybe he didn't know what he was doing. You know, he was just trying to fix an election and also have foreign actors interfere in an election. It seems like he had the best at, in heart. This just this seems like a big mistake, Rick. No, I, I'm not buying that. <laughs> but, no, but that's what we hear, isn't it? He's the guy who took down the mob. And yet here he is tied up in a mob kind of kind of scheme, isn't he? Yeah, it's always weird how the people who take on the mob somehow or another end up acting like the mob a lot of the time. And they're kind of trying to push the mob off their corner of the block. I mean, Rudy Giuliani has been pulling these stunts for the longest time. And the thing is eventually it just kept going and going and going. And like you said, he's been involved in some dirty business. I mean, some real dirty, dirty business. And to try and interfere in a presidential election by trying to work through organized crime in Ukraine and Russia just to try and, and overthrow an election. Um, I, I mean, this thing was a long time coming. It really was. And you have to think with somebody like Giuliani, if they're not completely in the cups or they're not just completely delusional, they have to expect that knock on the door at some point because this was playing with fire for years. Yeah, I, I had a bunch of people right away going, how can they possibly do that? He's the president's lawyer. There's, there's lawyer client privilege. And I say, yeah, that's true. Unless he's complicit in the crime, unless he's the criminal doing it, then that's all out the window. Yeah, it was something, wasn't it? I'm, I'm thinking back now. I, I, I don't know if enough time has passed that we've all forgotten uh, Donald Trump's second impeachment. This was the guy who brought Donald Trump into the impeachment who came up with this crazy scheme that brought Trump along. And you could tell that Trump had like no idea what was real, what was false, what was a lie, what was true. And Giuliani just kept going and going and going. I mean, this was pushing the envelope in a way that this was, it was inevitable. And yeah. and to see it happen now is it's, it's shocking, but it's not surprising. Now, the message that I'm getting from the right is, well, this is just, or as Rudy's legal lawyer said, this is legal thuggery, that this is, this, I had one guy tell me this is what uh, the left was claiming uh, Donald Trump was going to do to Hillary. Uh, and I'm sure he tried. Uh, but this is what the, you know, the left is doing, what they claim the right was doing. And they're going after a former president. Are they going after a former president? I, I have no idea. But I'll tell you what, Donald Trump is going to test the maxim that former presidents don't get prosecuted. Because, I mean, I, I'm sorry, it was four years of reckless grift and greed and everything. And, and that's the thing about Donald Trump. He was so artless in his corruption. It was so, I mean, like he would go on TV and tell you he was being corrupt and that he was breaking the <laughs> law. I mean, the, the fact that he has tried to see what a person can get away with the office of the president, like it's incredible. And, and I have to tell you, the Justice Department does not want to go after a former president. The Justice Department does not want to go after Mr. Mayor or the lawyer or attorney for a former president. They forced this. They made this happen. I mean, at all costs, they made this happen. 
Yeah, Rudy's going to have an interesting next year or two. Uh, and the fact that he, what he's, he's being named in lawsuits that are like, you know, like gazillions of dollars by the two voting companies. And uh, I mean, this his troubles are not going to end anytime soon. Yeah. What is it? Uh, his old associate, Roger Stone, used to say it's his time in the barrel. I mean, he is deep, dark in the barrel right now. And, and, and I have to tell you, I've talked to enough people who have covered the Giuliani beat. He has left behind enough damning evidence over the past couple of years that, I mean, if people just start picking it up off the street like pennies, he is in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm good for him. Good. Good for him. I, <laughs> he I, earned I, it, Rick. He, he did earn it. it. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Uh, speaking of earning it, your state of Georgia, evidently there's uh, federal hate crimes have been charged against the three guys uh, who, I, you know, I guess we're driving around shooting this 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 black guy Amin Arbery, uh, but now 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 they're charged with three federal crimes uh, above and beyond the state crimes. Uh, thoughts? Well, first of all, the whole thing has been sickening from the very beginning, and you know this is something um, we we've talked a few times about this. The American right, particularly because they're animated by white supremacy and the protection of capitalism through white supremacy. Um, they, have, they have gone from dog whistles to bullhorns, right? And in and, and all of this violence, whether it's vigilantes in the street or whether it's law enforcement stepping on somebody's neck, this stuff has become more and more blatant and more and more aggressive. This was another situation, again, that is surprising but not shocking. Right. Because this is something that we've been building towards, which is open violence. And we've seen it in America before. I mean, we've had, you know, epidemics of lynching. We've had vigilante violence. We've had paramilitary groups in the streets and in people's homes. Uh, it was unfortunate that things like this were inevitable, but they, they really were, particularly with the persuasion on the right. Yeah, but you know, what you hear from the right is that you know th that everything now is is white supremacy. That that everything is 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 now this this extreme. And I look at this and I'm going, I don't know what else to call this when three white guys chase down a black guy who's dry, just jogging uh, in a neighborhood and they execute him. I, I'm sorry, I I don't know. I don't know what else to call that. Yeah, one of the basic tenets of white supremacy is the idea that African Americans and people of color are constant sources of potential violence. I mean, this is one of the things, if, if people want to understand this, this is one of the reasons why the NRA has become one of the major influential organizations in the United States of America, and why we can't do anything about mass shootings. It, because this is an organization that is partnered with the Republican Party to convince white people that they need these guns, because at any moment they might need to fight a race war or protect their family from people, and it has gone from the idea of protection to offense, going out and looking for problems and policing, much like the old slave patrols were, fugitive slave patrols were. I mean, this is an American tradition. That's the sad truth of it. What we're dealing with right now is nothing new, but in the light of day in 2021, it's, it's, it's ugly, it's documented. We have our cell phones, we're watching this stuff. But this is not new, this is America's legacy. And it's, uh, it's not a thing that is emerging, but it is a thing that is starting to get worse. Yeah, on the gun, on the gun issue, I. I had always said if you want to you want to start seeing uh, some of these 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 gun nuts you know start talking about regulation, I say just start arming every every black person and and you'll see them change change their tune. And and look, I remember seeing the video of like a thousand black guys carrying um, you know what was, there we got their AR-15s or whatever their costumes were uh, walking up stone in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, that that was a powerful moment. Yeah, I don't know if you remember this, but this was right around 2008 to 2010. Fox News showed uh, members of a, a black liberation group who were using their Second Amendment rights to open carry. And it led every show for months, if not years. And this is where they give up the game. Right. Because what it is, is it's about, no, certain people should be armed. And by the way, let's go ahead and take that to its logical conclusion. Only certain people should vote. 
which I think we've seen this too. Even the National Review is like, oh, maybe we don't need more people voting. We need better people. Voting. Right. <laughs> and by the way, like this is nothing, again, that's new. This is a resurgence of Jim Crow. Right. This is old American white supremacist tradition, which is all about maintaining political power, but also economic control. And the fact that all of this is starting to come up and it's all starting to grow more and more aggressive should tell you where we are in this country. Now, I, now, when I brought that up, I had a black friend go, no, no, that's a bad idea, uh, because then that's going to give them a reason to gun us down. And, uh, you know, I didn't think about it in that way. No, absolutely not. I mean, this is, you know, it's really easy sometimes. And this is the Republican trap. We've seen this for years, right? Which is, oh, they're doing this, so we should go ahead and have our own version of this. I noticed it a few months ago. Our listeners started talking about all of these Republican blogs and individuals who are like, maybe we need our own country, right? Maybe we should just go ahead and split and have two countries. And I, and Rick, I, I haven't read a history book in a couple of days, but uh, I saw what happened in the mid of, middle of the 19th century. And I have to tell you that when one country separates into another, they don't just separate. They go into separate corners and then they come out swinging. Right. So this is one of those things that we have to be very careful about because they are engaging in bad faith politics. And that can lead us down a really insidious road. Now, the scary part about this, to, to highlight what you're saying, is we just saw it, it was apportionment day the, the other day. Uh, now we're seeing this southern shift in political power. Seven more congressional seats are being taken pretty much from the industrial Midwest uh, that used to be the economic powerhouse and moving its way uh, into southern southern control. Politically, we could end up having a much a much different world in a, in a couple of years. Yeah, and you're talking my language here. I come from Indiana. I currently live down in Georgia. My family are factory workers, laborers, miners, those types of things. You know, what we have seen is uh, largely an industrial shift. Down in the South, they, are, they basically have written blank checks to corporations and business owners that said, come down here, you're not going to have to worry about unions, you're not going to have to worry about regulations. Matter of fact, you, we're not even going to make you pay taxes, right? You're just going to come down here and live high off the hog. Well, guess what? People go where the jobs are. And the fact that those people have not been protected, they have not been advocated for in, in basically in the two-party system more or less for years has led to a demographic shift that is uh, really disturbing. And I think this is one of the things that we're going to have to focus on in the next few years, which is a realignment of industry, a realignment of union uh, solidarity movements. And, I, and, and we, we have to. We have corporations at this point that are not just monopolies, but they are like super monopolies, right? That are taking advantage of all of these things that the right has been pushing in their battle against organized labor and solidarity for years. So we're definitely seeing the numbers change and a large part of it, I think, has to do with that. No, you're absolutely right. But, you know, this is where I've been saying, you know, the Democratic Party, you know, basically abandoning working people from, oh, I don't know, my entire life. <laughs> Uh, has been a bad thing. And so I'm glad to see Joe Biden is at least, you know, making some some moves to try and strengthen labor laws. Because, look, if we can't organize the South, especially as the, this this economic shift and political shift happens, uh, we're quickly going to move into a, a kind of fascist country that uh, most, I think, right thinking people should be afraid of. Yeah. And, you know, let's just dip back into history and then jump forward a little bit. Um, we don't spend a lot of time looking at the Civil War and why it happened. We like to we like to do a little bit of paragraph and then talk about all of the battles. But one of the reasons that it occurred was because of uh, shifts in terms of labor and economics. And what you ended up having in the South was not just a stratified hierarchical racial society, but a stratified labor society right? Where people were being held down, they weren't being paid anything, they weren't being taken care of. These things happen in cycles. But I think you and I talked, I want to say it was back in December after the election was finally decided. And we were talking about what Joe Biden could possibly be and what we expected out of this presidency. And, you know, a lot of people have said to me, I didn't know Joe Biden was so progressive. I don't think he's progressive. I think that Joe Biden knows where the wind is blowing and what we are seeing. And by the way, we're, we're taping this before he gives his speech tonight. One of the things that uh, or maybe we're live, I don't know how things work. And so <laughs> he's going to give the speech tonight. And, and you and I both watch Democratic presidents talk about, well, we would love to give money to things, but we can't. We just can't. We're in an age of austerity. The age of big government is gone. That's done. 
We don't live in that era anymore. Right. And even somebody who has been a moderate Democrat, and by the way, Joe Biden, folks, has been a friend of big businesses, corporations, banks his entire life. He was the senator from Delaware yes. of all states. Yes. He's not doing this because he's feeling like he wants to hand things out to people or he wants to bring back the era of big government. It's a necessity. This country will fall apart if we don't push back against exactly what you were talking about, that rightward shift in our economics and politics. No, you're, you're spot on. And I and I said it before, he was my fourth choice, maybe fifth. I'm not really sure. I'm still, he's, he's right there in that fighting for fourth, probably fifth, but he, he's rising to the moment. Uh, he, I think you're right. He's seeing what's going on and he's adjusting to it. And I'm, I'm glad uh, so far that he has. Now, some people are saying uh, he's not going far enough. I'm thrilled with how far he's going. Uh, and we need to push and make sure that he can. Um, because here, here's at the end of it, I do believe it comes back down. Do you make people's lives better or do you make them worse? And I think if he gets an infrastructure bill pushed through, we get the $15 an hour minimum wage, at least on the federal level as he's done. I think you're going to help make people's lives better. And then you make that argument of, do you really want to go back to what we had before? Listen, I'm just thrilled we have a president who's not considering throwing a nuclear bomb in the middle of a hurricane. Brian, I'll be real. Yeah. But I will go ahead and I will say, and, and we've known this for a while. This has been an argument that people on the left have been telling Democrats for years. Stop being afraid of leftist progressive ideas. Yep. They're popular. And right now, Biden's popularity, uh, it reflects the fact that helping people, making the government work for them and ending the giant suck of redistributive wealth from the bottom to the top and like actually returning something to the people and making this country a little bit fair, a little bit more human. There's a real possibility that fire will catch on. So the idea of moving further left and making that progress happen, it starts by those little victories that make the Democratic Party, who, by the way, they're like a scared little animal. They need to be coaxed out from underneath the bed and they need to understand it's OK to go back to your roots and to go back to uh, taking care of vulnerable populations and organized labor and solidarity. Once they realize that, there is always a possibility that they could go farther. And I'm with you right now. This is an encouraging beginning. Yeah, it is. I like the way you put it. I like the way you put it better. It coaxed out as where I'm saying you need to you need to boot them out into the middle. Uh, that's where we'll go. But, Jared, always great talking with you. I always appreciate your thoughts and your insight. Uh, thanks so much for your time. You're the best, Rick. Thanks, man. Good stuff, Jared Yates Sexton. Make sure you check out his podcast, the Muck Rake Podcast. Also the book. American rule, how a nation conquered the world but failed its people. We'll get links out on how you can take a look at that and hopefully you pick it up. I'm going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith. <laughs> 